Hey, what's up everyone? This is Nick and today we're doing another movie review. This is for Jurassic World Dominion. I did just see this movie uh, yesterday, so uh, that was Thursday, June 9th, uh, opening night. I went to a uh, late evening showing of it. Uh, now this is a spoiler-free review, so we will discuss some general plot points, locations, characters, etc. in the film. But we're not going to go into specifics. We're not going to talk about the ending or any potential deaths or anything like that in the movie. No spoilers here. Uh, because the movie did just come out, I will post a spoiler review slash discussion later on in the week after I've given more people some time to see the movie on their own. Uh, so this is probably going to be a shorter video because we can't really talk about things in great depth here. Um, but I'm just talking about my initial reactions overall here. Uh, so I did see this at an AMC theater. They were offering a double feature of both the original Jurassic Park and this latest film, uh, which I would have liked to have gone, but it was start that one started a little too early in the day and I couldn't get off work in time. Uh, so I just went to the showing of uh, Dominion just as a standalone uh, film. Uh, now at AMC theaters, they do sell these popcorn tins, uh, which usually I don't buy into this kind of stuff, but this was like $7.99. It's a good size tin and it has a nice embossed uh, Jurassic World logo on it and it has the Velociraptor blue uh, with the embossed scales and the eye on it as well. So it has a really nice texture to it. Really good quality. You know, it's large, nice, sturdy, great colors. And uh, again, $7.99, that's not bad. And the way I saw it is this is you know, build as the last Jurassic movie. We'll have to see if it really is, you know, will they resurrect this again in a couple years or shorter than that or longer than that? We'll have to see. Um, I find it hard to believe that they're, that Universal is never going to touch this franchise again just because it clearly makes them so much money. And I'm sure this movie is going to make quite a lot. Uh, so just in case I went ahead and got it because I was like, well, I don't do this thing that often. I really don't go to the movies too often. I usually just go when it's for a franchise that I really like. Uh, I prefer just streaming things for the most part now. Uh, but this was a special event. Jurassic Park, the original film, is my favorite movie of all time and one of my favorite franchises. And as you know from watching this channel, I love to collect and review dinosaur and prehistoric memorabilia. Um, but yeah, this was really nicely done, good quality. Um, a friend of mine went to an AMC theater where they were out of the tins, but they were selling these cool cups. Uh, mine didn't have any cups or anything like that. And another friend of mine went to an AMC theater and went to the double feature, and he got the tin, and he also got like an NFT. Uh, and then he bought a couple extra seats to get different NFTs. I haven't seen what they look like. I, um... I know a little bit about NFTs. I didn't really get into that whole thing, but it is, you know, an interesting add-on. So, uh, on to the movie itself. So, going into this, I knew the reviews were really, really bad. The reviews were worse than I was expecting. I was expecting the Rotten Tomatoes score to probably be, like, low 70s, mid-60s, somewhere around there. Somewhere between Fallen Kingdom and uh, Jurassic World. And with... Uh, Colin Trevorrow returning the promise of the return of the original cast and more practical animatronic effects. I was anticipating this movie, um, especially after seeing the trailers, to be as good, if not a little bit better, than Jurassic World, the 2015 film. But better than Fallen Kingdom, uh, which, having more time to reflect on that movie, I would say Fallen Kingdom... Uh, was the worst of the series. Uh, not that it's a bad movie, it just, you know, compared to the others, it wasn't my favorite. For a number of reasons I won't get into here. Um, so, you know, again, I was expecting this, the Rotten Tomatoes score to be, you know, somewhere in the 60s or 70s, um, you know, and it was really in like the 30s uh, by the time I went into the theater. And I'm thinking, well, that's like um, Transformers sequel territory, you know, like those uh, the Michael Bay Transformer movies, um, which, you know, the first one I really liked, but 
the other ones after that were not my thing. I'll just say that. So then I started to get a little concerned, and I was having some flashbacks to Matrix Resurrections, where that movie scored decently on Rotten Tomatoes. And I said to myself, oh, well, Reloaded and Revolution scored really low amongst critics, and I love those movies, so I must, I'm must i probably going to really like Resurrections. And then I, I went into that, and that was just abysmal. Um, so I went into this a little nervous, because I was like, you know, this is two and a half hours. Is this going to give me a migraine? Is it going to infuriate me? Um, but I really, really enjoyed this movie. I would say it is... Well, it's definitely better than Fallen Kingdom. I would say it's better than Jurassic World, which is a really solid movie. The 2015 one, the first one with Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard. Um, I really do like Jurassic Park 3. I think it's a solid film. Uh, it's the weakest of the original trilogy. Um, but I would say that Dominion is better than Jurassic Park 3. I have a soft spot for The Lost World. I really love The Lost World. I know non-Jurassic Park fans typically dislike that movie, but Jurassic Park fans all seem to like that movie. I can totally understand why. Um, but yeah, I would say this isn't quite as good as The Lost World, but that could just be the nostalgia there. Uh, and then, of course, it's not as good as the original movie. No, you know, no one is expecting that it would be. So I would say Jurassic World Dominion, I would say out of the six movies, I would rank this as the third best. So kind of right in the middle there. Um, you know, and again, it's pretty close to The Lost World. Just I, The Lost World is edged out a little bit more for me. Uh, something about the atmosphere of that movie, um, the craftsmanship. It's just, th those first two movies are very, very realistic. And I feel that that level of realism has never really been captured by uh, the third one or the new trilogy. Um, but again, what really helps Dominion here is the return of the original cast. Now, I did know going into this that they weren't just going to be cameos. I knew that they were going to be uh, in the entirety of the film. But I did just think that they were just going to have smaller, more supporting roles, like similar to Harrison Ford in The Force Awakens or Carrie Fisher um, in uh, Rise of Skywalker in The Last Jedi. Uh, where, you know, they, they're in maybe like cumulatively 25% of the movie. However, uh, much to my surprise, Sam Neill, Laura Dern, and Jeff Goldblum, they all reprised their original roles and were in the movie, I would say, by the end, it felt like they were in it more than Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard. I felt that Owen and Claire became the secondary characters by the halfway point in the film, and I felt that the leads were Grant, Ellie, and Malcolm, which really delighted me, especially since Sam Neill, Laura Dern, and Jeff Goldblum all just stepped back into their roles perfectly. It felt like no time has passed at all. They've aged very well, and they just perfectly, perfectly represent uh, and emulate their original characters. The mannerisms, the way they speak, the way they act, it is 100% how you would expect them to because it's both very similar to how they uh, acted uh, amongst each other in the first movie, but it also factors in that nearly 30 years has passed, so they are going to be a little bit different as well. Uh, so sometimes when they bring back uh, actors into a franchise that they haven't been in for years, it almost kind of feels like an SNL skit, like they're kind of almost putting on an act and they're, they might not take it quite as seriously. Here, uh, again, Sam, ne Sam Neill, Laura Dern, Jeff Goldblum, it, it, they just, you could tell they enjoyed doing this and that they took it seriously. And that is one of the things that really elevated the quality of the movie. And usually when I watch a film, I just kind of sit there with like a blank expression, whether I like it or not, and I just kind of take it in. Uh, but I was sitting there just shaking my head, smiling, just cheesing um, the whole way through the second half of the film. Because that's when it really, really, really uh, gets heavy with the original cast. And they really just take the reins and they seem to take the lead uh, charge of the film. And uh, it deals with more of the original themes and 
things that were introduced in the original movie and the novels and uh, just really, really, um, it really gets good at that point. So my criticism, my big criticism of the movie, though, is the first, I'd say, 30, 40 minutes, which is a substantial amount of time. I mean, the movie is two and a half hours long, so this is at least a fifth of the movie. I would say it was fine, that first fifth of the movie. I was like, eh, this is okay. I was very disappointed that the prologue that they released as like a sneak peek about a year ago, the first five minutes of the movie, was released in IMAX as a prologue, uh, I think at the beginning of Fast and Furious, and then they released it around Thanksgiving online for everyone to see. That was not in this movie. It had a different opening, which on one end is, you know, potentially exciting because it's like, okay, now I don't know what the first five minutes is. You have a new scene that I haven't seen before. But it was just stuff from the trailers that we had seen. And uh, I think most of this first couple minutes was released as a different clip anyway. And for some reason, this montage that the movie starts with showing dinosaurs in different locations relied entirely on CG. And the CG looked really, really rough in those first couple minutes. I mean, there were a couple creatures that didn't even look like they had a shadow or were shaded properly or lit properly based on where they were located. Uh, it looked more like something that was made with a lower budget really quickly for TV. So I'm sitting there thinking like, uh-oh, this is not going to be good. Uh, but then after that first opening sequence, like that first five minutes or so, all of a sudden the CGI was really crisp, really detailed. Some of the best CGI in the whole series. Uh, definitely the most detailed, I would say. Uh, I still think the first is the most convincing just because they really did a good job concealing things with the rain and the darkness and using it as minimally as they could. Um, but again, it's kind of apples to oranges. That movie's, you know, from 30 years ago and they were really trying to hide things. And this one, you know, here, it, it's a different situation, a different situation. But um, while I'm talking about the effects, I will say that uh, this one used a lot more practical effects. The most practical effects out of this um, new trilogy, not quite as many practical effects as the uh, original trilogy, but pretty close, pretty close. I would say it was probably like 65 to 70 percent CG and like, you know, like 30 to 40 percent practical. Um, not sure if those percentages are really adding up, but but you get the idea. It's not quite 50-50 like it was in the original trilogy, but it's pretty, pretty close. Uh, definitely a lot more than uh, Fallen Kingdom way more than um, JW, which Jurassic World used almost entirely CGI, except for maybe one scene. Um, but this one here, it was a good blend, a very good blend. Uh, I think every dinosaur had a animatronic version and a CGI counterpart, so you got to see a good mix of them. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any dinosaurs where we really only saw them in CG. I think the Tyrannosaurus and the Pyroraptor um, maybe the Atrociraptors were all CG. I'm trying to think if there were any practical effects of them tucked in there, but I think all the other dinosaurs, uh, had, um, practical effects counterparts that we saw a lot of, uh, in regards to their animatronics. Uh, the Quetzalcapolis was all CG from what I can remember. Obviously the sauropods, um, but like Dilophosaurus, Giganotosaurus, um, you know, those, we, we got a lot of animatronics uh, of them, which was very impressive, very good. Not Stan Winston level, but also not um, like amusement park ride animatronic level, which some critics were saying that they were very stiff and jerky like that. I didn't get that impression at all. I thought they were very fluid, very realistic. Again, not Stan Winston's level, but they were pretty close to that. Um, but yeah, going back to the first fifth of the movie... It does a lot of location hopping. It's trying to set up a lot at once. Um, mainly focused on Owen and Claire and Maisie and what they're up to, as well as Blue and Beta. And there's the whole sequence in Malta, which I, I think gets a little bit closer to like the, maybe like the end of the, the first act. 
Uh, and that's the sequence we see heavily referenced in the trailers, in the posters, with the Atrociraptors chasing Owen uh, through Malta. And, you know, I that was fine, it was fun, but I feel like the reason they put that in the movie was when they started filming Dominion, uh, COVID had just started happening. And right before COVID, the, uh, I think it's No Time to Die, the most recent James Bond movie, had already uh, been close to being ready to be re released. It was close to its release date, and then it kept getting pushed back. And I know that movie has some kind of sequence that looks very similar, um, both in regards to the atmosphere and the way it's shot. And I feel like a, a lot of elements that are in this movie is universal going down the checklist, making sure that they borrow as many things as possible from different types of franchises and movie series to put it in this movie to make sure that they have as big an, a big a appeal as possible and bring in as many different people as possible, uh, Jurassic Park fans and people that aren't fans. But the thing is, the series has always been a, a mega blockbuster, so I don't understand why they felt the need to do that. Jurassic Park is big enough. You don't need to try and cram in other things to make it more like Indiana Jones or more like James Bond to bring in people because there's a lot of overlap there. I feel like it already has a big enough appeal. The only thing I can think of is they were potentially concerned that because the, re the reaction to Fallen Kingdom, both from critics and audiences, wasn't very good, that not many people would return this time, or not as many as they had hoped. So they tweaked this movie and tried to cram in as many different elements as they could to guarantee that they'd have uh, as broad appeal as possible. Um, also, I don't really know how popular Jurassic uh, Park, Jurassic World is in other countries. Like I know, for example, Star Wars is huge here. Star Wars movies are usually guaranteed to be a hit, but overseas they're typically not as big uh, in other countries. Uh, so I'm wondering if maybe Jurassic Park is as big in some countries and they were doing this to try and boost the box office in the other nations. I'm not sure. But it did feel like they were trying to cram all that in there. On top of that, they are trying to also cram in elements that they know really worked in some of the previous movies. So again, you have a motorcycle chase with Owen. Uh, you have uh, a big battle between large theropods in your third act. Um, so things that they know worked in the previous films, they're trying to bring back here to guarantee that people like it, to guarantee that it uh, gets that positive feedback, at least from audiences, uh, and so that there will be uh, you know, multiple screenings, multiple viewings from people that liked it. Um, so it, I think Universal was a little too concerned about diminishing returns, especially since this is the sixth in the series. And again, Fallen Kingdom, the most pre the previous one, wasn't as well received by critics and uh, fans alike. So I think they were just being a little too cautious there and trying to cram in too many uh, elements from other film series. And on top of that, they're cramming in multiple elements from the previous film. So it felt very cluttered in that first third, but then all of a sudden the movie kind of gets its rhythm, it gets its flow, it gets its feeling, uh, and that is once we're really focused on this uh, Biosyn facility, which I love the fact that we get to experience and learn more about Biosyn. It's always been talked about heavily in the Michael Crichton books. Um, we get to see Lewis Dotson again, and I feel like his... Uh, character here, you know, again, it's obviously played by a different actor. You can look up online why the uh, original actor is not returning to reprise his role. Um, but this guy, uh, he did a great job. I really liked his portrayal. Um, he feels, acts, and looks different than Dotson in the first movie, but it's acceptable to me. It's been nearly 30 years. People change in that amount of time. Uh, and even though this is different than I expected Dotson to be, I really liked his portrayal. I feel like he was borrowing a little bit of Steve Jobs, a little bit of Bill Gates, but he was still uh, making it his own as well. Uh, so I was really happy to see him. Uh, I liked all the scenes with him, honestly. And um, let's talk about uh, some of the dinosaurs. So my favorite dinosaurs here 
Uh, obviously, Giganotosaurus was a great new addition. Loved all the sequences uh, with him. I think we got more screen time than I expected. Uh, you know, about the same, if not more. Uh, so we got a good amount of Giganotosaurus. Perfect blend between CGI and practical. I think uh, we got the most practical out of uh, that dinosaur, as well as Dilophosaurus. Great mix of practical and CGI. Um, blue, there was not a lot of blue in this movie, uh, but that void was filled by uh, Beta and the Pyroraptor and the Atrociraptors as well. I didn't care too much about the Atrociraptors or the Pyroraptor. Um, they just... They were just kind of thrown in there. They don't really serve any kind of significance to the plot. Uh, in regards to, obviously, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, I was very surprised that the T-Rex does not get much screen time uh, at all. Uh, T-Rex gets less screen time, I'd say, than the Giganotosaurus. And, um, yeah, very, very little screen time. This is probably, I'd say it's probably about the same amount of screen time uh, that the Tyrannosaurus got in the first uh, Jurassic World from 2015. So I was very surprised by that, uh, but the moments uh, that we do get to see the T-Rex are very impactful. They do certainly count. Um, but beyond that, uh, I will save the rest of this discussion for the uh, spoiler review, which I will post uh, later this week. So if you haven't already, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Goodbye.